language is not merely a means of description. It's a way of uh, not only interpreting, but showing how we experience the world. And if we're denied the possibility of passing on that way of experiencing things to our children and they to their children, that's a great iniquity. Uh, language is more than what it seems to be. It's, it's, it's fundamental to identity and to experience. And to deny a people their language is a kind of cultural genocide that I think has been willfully perpetrated against peoples throughout history. This is a poem by Christina Costi. It's called Speech. Don't say no, say now. And don't say coo, say cow. And the bairns all shouted and roared with laughter. When I said after instead of after. She gave me a, the clipe because I said live instead of the palm of my hand. And she howled in me gansey and gave me a rive when I could not understand. Your English is terrible, boy, she roared. I just can't comprehend it. But I was not speaking English, though the poor soul didn't ken it. So out afore the door I gid to curl me heels, said she, saying, Ervo and Hickson and Bat and Dunder, I really feel I could take you asunder, you horrid, unteachable boy. So I'm thout and thout about it ah, and I'll hear the best of the bargain. I'll tack me clays and me money box and just ging him till Bergen. And this is a poem I wrote about my dad. Um, who grew up in Stronsey and, uh, and used to be in and out of the water, in and out of the sea all summer. This is called Lobster Berries. All summer as a bairn, in and out of the sea, he kent where the lobsters keep to hide, where water lip the rock, would keep an eye on blue class, reach round the tail, scoop out the lobster berries afore she could snap, sip and wheat plit her onto the shore and glep them doon. Years on, minding the taste face chair, his mouth smacked salt and sweet, lobster berries. The name it sail exotic to his toon bairns. Pink, see-through, sea tapioca, pomegranate seeds, blinks of sun. I was wheel grown up before I learnt who dark the beads of row that would fleck his mouth blue. Older still and fair too late, before I thought to ask. Okay, so I'll, I'll read uh, one of uh, Rory, Rory McComish's pieces, or Derek Thompson, um, called Kishtich uh, and uh, which translates as Coffins. Um, and I'll just read the last verse because it's, it's fairly long. Um, and it's about, I think it was his grandfather's workshop, who was a joiner, um, and he would... Uh, often be in his workshop and he talks about the smell of the the uh, mean scythe, the sawdust and all the tools he had and he would make these old style uh, coffins and then in the final verse which which I'll read he talks about in the school as well how it was um, the school was in a sense building coffins for his language and culture and he was kind of unaware of that when he was going through school but he sees it sees now that his, his language was being buried in the new style coffins with their varnish and their braid and their brass and that kind of stuff. Is Elsa Skol Elu Kujok, Sin Ra Sir and Hainchen a Lochkrug, Hatuk Minare, Donakishik and Laya, get the Vatan and Suyam and Korstoro, Hataganikmi and Braid Bule, and Yev Gaute, Vatol Erenich, Hatalyev me in a Fakil at a Frash, Hatahikmi. Gromochinich et al baas, Gusentanik ge ur in Yarichse, a lochkrug a chrie, Gus negarich me netarikin et al thron, Schachlanich te nyokorug in krag. And in the other school also, where the joiners of the mind were planing, I never noticed the coffins, though they were sitting all round me. I did not recognize the English braid, the lowland varnish being applied to the wood. I did not read the words in the brass. I did not understand that my race was dying. 
until the cold wind of this spring came to plain the heart, until I felt the nails piercing me and neither tea nor talk will heal the pain. Oh, that was lovely. I mean, it, it, that's, that's one of the things that sounds so lovely and yet it's talking about something very, you know, really serious and um, brutal. <laughs> Um, so this poem that I'm going to read is by Beth Fullerton and it's called Tongue, um, which was inspired by a poem that Beth saw in Ottawa's Museum of Nations, I Lost My Talk by Rita Jo. You tried to tack my midder tongue, but she was always there, waiting, when I wan hum for Bell's brace school. You tried to make me spick like you, taught me words worth golden daffodils and Kipling's thunderous dawn, yet hid for me the simmer dim of Vagoland. I used your words so you could understand. Deep inside, I was saying them in Shetland. Knew you ax, where are the words you used when you were young? You tried to tack my midder tongue, but she was always there, waiting beyond the riv of your horizon, just waiting to belang. Um, and the next poem I'm going to read is one called um, Sat to the Blood, which was the first poem that I ever read, uh, wrote in dialect. Um, and uh, it's about kind of muddling through the linguistic inheritance of Shetland, so sat at the blood. Lass, do's parch thy tongue o' thy ain land. Canap at thy word say dry, thy sift between thy teeth like sand, spritting down an hourglass. I give thee a language. One that could cap that the percussion or wave supports consonants, unravel the threads of the soul with a single word. Shurmo, Maril, Bon Hoga, a gift that does left out to moulder of the rees. Let me start o'er. Last do does na hear the words to had me on the page and will never find me there until do understands the sat that curses through thy veins as the lifeblood on an all their conversation when that ebbs and floods just as the tide. These words are my hansel to thee. Tack them, give them a pulse. The reason I chose this poem, apart from the fact that I'm a huge fan of Ian Crichton Smith, who I think is still somewhat underrated. It's very pertinent, this poem in its entirety. It's maybe a little too long to read in its entirety here, uh, but I love the fact that Ian Crichton Smith achieved everything he did as a writer from Lewis. And what, one of the things I find fascinating about him is that some, some people think his relationship with Lewis and his culture was complicated. I don't think it was complicated. I think it was honest. And in this poem, Shall Gallic Die, he's uh, much less equivocal and much more determined to show something that I think people sometimes overlook in his work, a real passion for the language and the culture. And he writes in a manner that's very characteristic in that it's imaginative, clear, and deep all at the same time. Nobody else could write images such as we'll see in this poem. Most people, when they think about Gaelic, their mind wouldn't automatically turn to tropes such as spaceships or the philosopher Wittgenstein. But Ian Crichton Smith is Ian Crichton Smith, and that's how his mind works. So I'll just read these two parts. Part five reads uh, like this in English. And I just want to say also, in terms of language, I think Ian is also enormously underrated as a translator, not only of his own work, but of other poets. And I think his translations of 
Donachach Ban and Sorli McLean are pretty much unsurpassable. So this is, I think, a really nice translation uh, from his original Gaelic. He who loses his language loses his world. The Highlander who loses his language loses his world. The spaceship that goes astray among planets loses the world. In an orange world, how would you know orange? In a world without evil, how would you know good? Wittgenstein is in the middle of his world. He is like a spider. The flies come to him. Kuan and Kalya rising. When Wittgenstein dies, his world dies. The thistle bends to the earth. The earth is tired of it. And part 11 is very abrupt and very, I think, potent. It's poignant. It's very, very powerful. There's a lot in this uh, single line of poetry. Part 11. Shall Gaelic die? What that means is, shall we die? 